Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love Online. And you know, when we were commemorating the resurrection of tomorrow and talking about all that we thank God for and all that the power of his resurrection means, listen, God sometimes has to take us all the way back to basics because we can get so advanced in so many areas We forget about the initial things that he's taught us, the fundamental truths. We forget about that. We lose sight of it. And where, you know, we might be gaining exploits and gaining ground in our grown life, our baby Christian areas that used to mean a lot, sometimes we gloss over it and we don't even think anything of it. So we're getting ready to go to, go with me, to Deuteronomy chapter five. I am the Lord thy God, verse six, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Now, for some of you, you might be thinking we're just talking about little idols and little Buddha statues and little uh, uh, Hindu gods and all of that. But for some of you, some of the gods you have before God himself is your cell phone. Some of you will feel crippled without your cell phone. Some of you, your God is the telephone, the TV, your favorite movies, your favorite TV programs. That's the, I call it the idiot box, whether it be a computer or a TV screen is the idiot box. That, for some of you, is your God. All right. And for some of, for some others of you, it's your lover or your other, whatever you want to call it. That is your God. Because if they want you to do A, B, and C, and God wants you to do C, D, and F, you do the A, B, C because you're more interested in pleasing that man or woman than you are in pleasing God. That's another form of having other gods before him. (laughs) Some of you, your God is your appetite or your secret pastimes. Moving right along, and you know what those are. All right, let's continue. From seven, thou shalt have none other gods before me. Number eight, Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself unto them, nor serve them. So let's let's insert Pat's two cents right in here. If you go to a church that encourages you to bow to statues of saints and angels and and uh, uh, seraphims and all of that, you are doing exactly what God said not to do right here. He wants you to go directly to him. You don't have to go through a man or a woman. Go directly to him. All right, here we go. Verse 9, thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. 10, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. All right. Now, when he talks about keeping my commandments, remember when Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He is the fulfillment, the embodiment of all of this right here that we're reading. So we are to be the same. God said he will write his law on our hearts, on our foreheads, not on tablets of stone. So that's why we can't just do away with this because it was written under the law. No, we have freedom. Yes, but this should be ingrained in our spirit. 
It's not a legalism. It should just be part of our character. It shouldn't be a chore to follow these. It should be a delight because of the new spirit that dwells in us, that of the Holy Spirit. All right, moving right along. <clears throat> 11, thou shalt not take, oh boy, this is a big one here. This is done all the time on TV, in movies, even on commercials. It just gets ridiculous how people do this and they don't even flinch. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I'll let you stew on that one for a minute. When was the last time you said the GD word? Hmm. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Whoa. Some of you, you, you may not say JD. I mean, uh, uh, G, GD. But some of you say JC. Hmm. Mm, what the heck was that about? Mm, mm, and I'm I'm grunting for for that name that you guys take in vain. What's wrong with you? Ah oh, ah! Oh. I don't get that. Yeah, well, you know what? God doesn't get it either. <laughs> All right, let's move right along. Um, and now here's one. This this one cracks me up. This is why we have service on Saturday, not out of legalism, but we delight to do it all. All right. So here we go. Mm. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Now we can argue that the Sabbath is a, is a Saturday or a Sunday or whatever day. You know, Jesus, number one, before we get into legalism, Jesus is our Sabbath. He said, I am Lord of the Sabbath. But if you were to go to the calendar, the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. And you know how the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament came from Hebrew to Greek to Latin to, to English? Well, listen, in Latin, which is where the Spanish word comes from. For Saturday, the Sabbath is Sabado, S-A-B-A. -A. Sabbath, S-A-B-B-A. -A. Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. Now, that's not about condemnation because this world has chosen another day. You know, the Bible says don't change the days and the times, but they chose to do so. And Sunday, for some of you who don't know, was named by the pagans after their son, God. So that's just a little FYI, not about condemnation, not about criticism, but just letting you see this is not just one verse on this subject. We gloss over it. Because the world has adopted a whole new system and it's so ingrained in the world, they don't think anything of it. But this is why we do this on, on Sabbath. This is why we don't do all our heavy labor on the Sabbath because of what this says right here. And like I said, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He's not writing it off the map. He's not eliminating any of these. He was the fulfillment of this in character, in his life, and everything he said and did. And we are to do the same. We are to follow him. But because the world system is so ingrained in Sunday being the magic day, that's fine. As long as you serve God, no matter what day, it should be every day of your life should be your Sabbath. But we only do this at, in honor of God, not out of fear of being condemned for not doing so. We do it out of love and honor for him. And there are some benefits for observing the Sabbath, just like there are benefits and blessings for reading the book of Revelation. All right. So moving right along. Mm. All right. Here we are. 
keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Here's another verse. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. So everything you got to do, even on Sunday, believe it or not, that's fine. <laughs> all right. Anyway, 14. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as you. So now what I want to say about this right here, all of this, this Sabbath thing is another form. It's, it's kind of a metaphor for Christ as well, because when you enter into Jesus Christ, you supposedly, according to Hebrew, you are supposed to have entered into his rest. When you enter into the rest of the Lord, you are at peace. You ceased from your own ways, your own struggles, your own wars, your own battles. Why? Because now you are casting all your care on him, letting him care for you. And you are resting in him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our rest. That is the epitome of what this is leading to right here. The Old Testament is a, is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ, got Jesus written all over it, including this Sabbath rest right here. That's Jesus. All right. So just so you don't take it so literally that you feel like, okay, if we don't keep that Saturday, we're not saved. No, no, no. Jesus is your Sabbath. I don't care what day you choose to go to church. Jesus is your Sabbath. We choose to do the seventh day only because that was God's original framework. That's all. That's all there is to it out of love and respect for him, in a form of honoring him. We do it his way. Now, if you don't love and honor him, that's fine. Even if you do, if you got to work on Saturday to pay the bills, uh, there's no condemnation there. You make sure that every day is a day for him. Every day you set aside time for him and you lay aside all your works as a lifestyle, not just on one day. Some of you who worship on Sabbath, you do everything you're big and bad enough to do throughout the week and you think you're saved because you observe the Sabbath, even though you just came out from under the sheets from you, from you know who, whoever that is, the night before. But guess what? or the day before, or the week before. But the bottom line is, observing the Sabbath is following Jesus Christ at this point. Because we are not under the law. We are in the dispensation of grace. So you are free. And you are not to be bound or let anybody judge you in meat, in drink, or in holy day. That's the balance of the word. Don't get caught up in condemnation. That's not what this is for. This is to remind you of where we are to be in our lives with the Lord, in character, in love, in obedience to holiness. He says, I am holy and I want you to be holy. Hmm. Be ye holy for I am holy. All right, moving right along. We're still on the Sabbath, believe it or not. This is the longest subject in the Ten Commandments, which begs me to wonder, hmm, how important was this to God? But leaving that right along, let's go on and read.
<laughs> so we already said thou shalt not do any work or thine ass, thy servant, and all that. 15. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm through the Lord thy God. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Commanded, not suggested, but I leave that up to you. Now, here's another thing I want you to think about. When you, when he talks about how you were serving in Egypt, that's another metaphor for New Testament. You were a servant of sin. You were a servant of the devil, a slave to the devil. You were bound, tied up, caught up in sin, caught up in, in, in uh, habits and addictions. And yes, addictions have demonic attachments. I thought I'd throw that in. Throw that in. You can give me a tip later. But the bottom line is, understand that when you enter into the rest of Jesus, it relieves you from the bondage of sin. Just want to make sure I tied the two together so you won't lose sight of that while you're listening to this. Because yes, this pertains to you. Once you are no longer a slave to sin, a slave to Satan, a slave to the ways of this world, the habits of this world, the bondages of this world, the cruelty of this world, guess what? You're set free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. All right, now. <laughs> Woo! Okay, so. And that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath. Hmm, didn't say suggest, but okay. Anyway, 16. Honor thy father and mother. Now, this is a biggie here because a lot of you, young and old, do not do this. Doesn't matter whether they deserve it or not. Didn't say, didn't stipulate conditions. It said, honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee that thy days may be prolonged. And that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So you want your life to, to avoid as many bumpy roads as possible. You want to avoid as many pit holes as possible. And, and you want to have a nice, long, healthy life. You honor your parents. You'd be surprised what that means. You hear me? Don't cuss them out. Don't tell them off. Don't slam the door in their face. Don't yell at them like they got 10 tails. No, you don't have that right. God did not give you permission to talk to your parents like they're nothing under your feet. <clears throat> 17, thou shalt not kill. I'm going to stop there for a second. You know, pull the car over, put it in park, because some of y'all kill with your tongue. You may not take a knife to anybody, but some of you have killed spirits with your words, your nasty, cruel attitudes. You're just mean spirited. You're critical. You're cynical. You just love embarrassing people in public. You love putting them down because you're going to make sure if you see any potential in them because you don't believe in yourself, you won't make sure they don't believe in themselves either. Nah, nah, you ain't nothing. You ain't never going to be nothing. No, I'm sorry, sweetheart. You are killing with your mouth. 18. Neither shalt thou commit adultery. Now that's that, that can go a lot of different ways. Adultery is betrayal. Just look at it like that. Betrayal. You made a vow to someone, whether it was in marriage, whether you're dating, whether it was to God himself, whether it was to a job. Some of you are policemen and you are committing adultery every minute of your life. Why? Because you vowed to protect and serve 
and you're out there beating and stealing and getting away with whatever you can get away with and lying and cheating and breaking every law under the sun because you got a badge that covers you. You are betraying your oath. You took an oath and you're betraying it. You're committing adultery on society, especially those of you who do racial profiling. Especially those of you who go and bust a dope house and then you take the goodies for yourself. You take the money for yourself and you have them so scared of you, so under your thumb. And you think you can get away with that because you got a badge, baby. God's got a payday for your behind. Bend over and crack a smile. It's coming. Ready or not, you ain't going to get away with it forever. That's a long time, that word right there. And don't let me talk about you politicians and what you do to people and all this human trafficking and all this crap you guys are wreaking on society. Crazy. All right. Neither shalt thou steal. Well, that's a given. That is self-explanatory. A lot of you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing in business deals. Some of you get on these phones and you get a hold of old people and you take their life savings with a bunch of lies, schemes, and games, and you laugh all the way to the bank. But God's going to have the last laugh on your behind. All right. Neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor. Mm. Now, we were talking about that this morning. You watch what you got to say about different people. I don't care if they're in politics. I don't care if they're in the churches, the, these mega churches. I don't care if it's your neighbor down the street you, or somebody in your family. You be careful how you talk about people because you can spread, you can give somebody a bad name. God might be getting ready to restore them to a position. He might be getting ready to reach out to them and restore them back into a higher level of ministry or, or take them to a point of repentance where they're about to make a public statement and apologize. They were wrong. The Lord showed them, but you're so busy out there spreading their name and smearing it. Ain't nobody going to pay them any attention. I don't care how many tears they shed. How many, how, many, how many ways they repent, how many things they change, the damage they've done, and they try to undo it. You're not going to believe it, and all the people you got through spreading their mess around, they're not going to believe it either. You watch how you slander people's names. All right, moving right along. Neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor. That's it right there. 21, neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his axe, his ox, his, his, his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. You know, a lot of you don't realize that's what you're doing. You're coveting. You look at somebody and they got that fine hump. Or you look at somebody's wife and you trying to figure out how you're going to get her over on your side. How you're going to get her in the sheets. How you're going to steal her from that man because cause you better than him. You better leave that alone. Some of you, are you're married. You got a flock, a, a church under you. And you're looking at all these men or all these women or all these girls or all these boys. And it's like a fresh meat market to you. And you're out there just, just coveting, just fantasizing about how you're going to work this one's body parts and that one's body parts and how you're going to get them all, you know, right there when you want them, they come running and, and you can do what you want with them because they part of your flock and you bees the pastor. No, don't even try that. You're really, really trampling on, on dangerous soil when you mess with God's people. Woo! These people putting their trust in you. And you're abusing the privilege. Whew. All right. Moving right along. Verse 22. These words, the Lord spake unto your assembly in the mount of the midst of the fire of the cloud and the thick darkness and, and a great vo with a great voice. And he added no more. And he wrote them 
in two tablets of stone and delivered them unto me. Now, I'm going to stop here because what God is doing now is everything that's on this and everything loosely affiliated with it is written in our hearts, written in our spirits. And if we find ourselves working against any of that, we need to ask God to realign us with his word, with his will, with the power of his Holy Spirit. That is that with the word of God. I felt like, I mean, when God led me to Deuteronomy 5, I knew exactly what that was. He's taking us back to basics. And sometimes you got to go over the rules. You know how they take senior citizens and they say, okay, you're of age now. We need you to go back and take a safety driving course. We need you to review the basic laws of the road. Why? Because sometimes you can form bad habits over years and you need to be reminded of what the real rules are, the real rules of safety. And some things we forget some things we lose sight of. How many of us are reading the the uh, DMV rules and, and traffic laws every day? No, we're not. We know we're not. Well, some of you are worse because you never open that Bible. You don't read it to build yourself up in the most holy faith. You don't read God's word to get to know his heart what's important to him. You don't read God's word to see what holiness really is, to see what love really looks like, acts like, walks like, and quacks like. You don't look at any of that. You want to look at his promises. Yeah, 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 that's good. That's fun. You want to look at the goodies, but you don't want to look at the requirements. You don't want to look at what God wants from you. Mm-hmm. And you definitely don't want to look at consequences. So what I say to you is read all the word. Get in the word and read it more often than you're doing it now. I have to read it more often myself. We all do. It's easy to slack up on reading it. But I'm telling you, God's word is a lie. It's alive and it will make you well in your spirit. It will cleanse you. It will wash you. It will purge. It will point out all the areas where you fall short. Ask me how I know. Mm -hmm. The word will correct you. The word will guide and warn you. My question is, how are you going to get warned? How are you going to get direction, correction, counsel, Hmm? How are you going to get cleansed if you're never in it? That's like wanting to be clean, but you never take a bath, never take a shower. Ain't going to happen, baby. All right. Please get into God's word. He did not go on the cross for you to take his Bible and stick it in the glove compartment or stick it in your bottom drawer or on your back shelf to collect dust. Jesus is the word. He is the fulfillment of the word. He is the word of God, capital W. In the beginning, for those of you who don't know that, in the beginning, John 1.1 1, 1, was the word. In the beginning was the word, capital W. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So for the, those of you who wonder, yeah, Jesus is the word and the word was God. And remember where it also says he became flesh and dwelt among us as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. See, all of that right there points to Jesus Christ being the divine son of God, not just a prophet. That's why you got to get into his word. And for some of you who are following these little makeshift Bibles that were written in the 1900s, and you're not going back to the word that deals with who Jesus really was before all these people came up with these crazy religions, you better go back to the original manuscript, baby.
because too much has been changed in all these other versions and all these other words that you're leaning and depending on. That's why you don't know who Jesus is, because whoever wrote that Bible doesn't know himself or didn't know when he wrote it. All right. Anyway, I'm done. God bless you. Enjoy. Enjoy Resurrection Day. Enjoy and celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray right now for those of you, I'm asking you, to, if you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please do. Please reconsider knowing that Jesus is himself God, knowing that Jesus died on the cross. Hmm? Mm-hmm. And by his stripes, you are healed. Knowing that he rose on the third day. You may not be convinced. People say all the time, you're going to give your heart to the Lord. You got to believe. Hey, most of us didn't have believe. We just, we just gave it a shot. And Jesus said, if you just have the faith of a mustard seed, which is probably about the size of of a uh, sesame seed or something smaller than that. That's all the faith you need. Just enough faith to, to say those words and, 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 and attempt to walk with him. Just put your hand on the doorknob, open the door and let him in, y'all. Let him in. See where it goes from that. But don't say no before you ever tried him. You know what that's like? That's like a person that's that's uh dry and, and dehydrated from wandering in the desert. And somebody comes and says, here, drink this water. And they say, no, I got to wait till I get home. I'll drink my own. I created my own. I, I buy bottled water. And they say, no, drink this water. And you're looking at it and it doesn't look the way you want it to look. So you don't want to drink it. And another day without water, you could die. But you don't want to drink their water. And they've got your life-saving uh, solution right there. And you won't take it. That's what you're doing when you deny Christ, when you refuse from letting him into your life. He is the medicine you need. He's the peace you need. He's the healing you need. He's all the love you've been scratching and digging for in this whole life, and you won't take it. Ah, all right. Anyway, I pray you do. I pray you wake up, smell the coffee, and say, okay, Lord. It's you and me from now on. Please forgive me. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. When you ask for forgiveness, you must always ask for to be filled with the Holy Spirit because you cannot walk this walk without the Holy Spirit no more than a car can drive without gasoline. You need the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. Amen. God bless you. Be saved, be blessed, be free. Be resurrected from the dead, y'all. God bless you. And remember, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. No one cometh to the Father except through him. Amen.